What is banking? Is it accounting or is it economics? When I was in high school, I was curious about how money works. So I took a course in economics, but I found it rather annoying, rather inconsistent. I preferred my courses in math, chemistry, and physics. So much so that I went on to do a degree in physics and a PhD in physics research, and I applied my physics in uh, industry and manufacturing. So it's rather a surprise that myself and physicist are here on the stage talking about economics. For the past 10 years, I've been privileged to be the member of the Foresight Group of an international company, a large design and engineering consultancy. Now, the Foresight remit is to explore what is changing our society and the way that we do business. Then, to see what is driving these changes and to help our colleagues apply these drivers of change in their own spheres, whether it might be in hotels, retail, modes of transportation. My own role is to keep an eye on the energy matters, physicists, conservation of energy, all that sort of thing. In 2005, I was looking at uh, oil and the oil supply and the concern that some have that uh, the supply of oil may fall short of demand. So I went to petrogeologists to see what sort of models they have and their models show that soon the supply of oil coming out of the ground is going to slow. Then I went to the economists and they say don't worry, the market will sort it all out. When the price goes up, the engineers and scientists will sort out the problem. Oh, is that it? It didn't really fill me with confidence. Today, we're here for this great project of the information age, new banking for society. And I'm going to kick off in my part, by looking at uh, these three themes. A subject not far from the headlines is growth, economic growth. This is an important subject. It gets very passionate interest. On the one hand, people say that growth is bad for society, bad for the world. On the other, a different perspective is that growth is essential for economies to be stable and survive. How to resolve these disparate views? Looking at a book is rather old-fashioned, but I thought I would go along to my local university bookshop to the economics section and see what the current reading is on economics. I took a book off the shelf. And on page three, this is what it says. The purpose of growth is to enjoy a higher standard of living. That's it. No discussion. Well, it says that in the past, housewives used to scrub the floors, wring out clothes, and now we have vacuum cleaners and washing machines. Uh, and that's it, really, which seems rather limited. The rest of the book is all about math, the thick tones. A colleague told me about a fascinating intellectual contest, no less. In 1987, the Santa Fe Institute in the state of New Mexico held a match. On one side squaring off were 10 important eminent economists led by the Nobel Prize winner, Kenneth Arrow. On the other side, up against them, were 10 non-economists, physicists, biologists, computer scientists, led by another Nobel Prize winner, Philip Anderson. So, 10 economists and 10 scientists, they spent 10 days debating economic behavior. Now, the scientists 
were impressed by the mathematical virtuosity of the economists. But they were amazed by the way that the economists has used simplifying assumptions. They'd taken these assumptions to an extreme, so much so that their models are divorced from reality. Strong stuff. Now, as a paid-up member of the Science Society, I thought, yes, there's a win for our team. But I'm only joking, I like economists, really. Scientists do also make simplifying assumptions but the thing is that these assumptions are not divorced from reality. And the other thing is that scientists test whether those assumptions matter to the answers that come from their theories. We're in an information age, but a word of caution about information. Information statistics, informatics. This is a rather fun engaging informatics graphic from Milan McCoon. The footprint on the left represents the carbon emissions from nations. And if you're going to make a footprint out of circles, you need a couple of large ones for the ball and the heel. China and the United States fit the bill. On the other side is representation of carbon emissions per capita by nation. And again, we need some large circles. So for the heel, the large circle is Gibraltar. Has anyone heard of Gibraltar? Oh, you have now. <laughs> Gibraltar is an island of 29,000. It's right on the tip of Spain at the mouth of the Mediterranean Sea. It's uh, an informatics graphic that makes a point about island nations. However, I would like a representation of statistics which is not agenda-driven. It is agnostic. My third theme is to do with ripples. Is, uh, does California benefit from um, or suffer from governance by proposition? You take a single issue and you have a pebble which you drop into a pond targeted on that issue. And the measure has ripples that extend out and have consequences much broader. And the thing is that an economy should be thought of as a system in the broadest sense. My three themes. So, as a scientist, I'm wondering can I get hold of uh, the data, make it into a model that forms a picture that gives some sort of understanding? This is what I was trying to explore. Now again, in 2005, I came across a model that appeared to say something about the capacity of economies to change. And this is a model by Malcolm Slessor, he started this work in the 1970s after the oil crises. Now, he's a professor of energy studies. He and his partner, Jane King, published a book about this work, Not By Money Alone. So this looks really intriguing. I only met Slessor for a few minutes. In 2007, he died at the ripe old age of 82. A Slessor is also a mountaineer. And in fact, he died climbing the Scottish Highlands. What a way to go. Now, to find out about this model, I needed to get it into the company, see how it works, do some programming, get my hands dirty, make it do something useful, uh, make it do some foresight. And what I found is it has a very good systems basis. But between the, the energy and the economics, it needed some development. And that's what's taken me six years to work that through. So now I want to share with you the culmination of that six-year journey on the shoulders of Slessor and give you some insights. 
Now, I like pictures, diagrams that somehow get across what's going on. And I'm going to reveal the picture to you through a jigsaw pattern. One piece by another piece. And at the end, you'll see it all. And it will be a picture related to gross domestic product or GDP. Which piece of the jigsaw to work with? This is where I go back to Slessor. And he starts from the assets, the physical infrastructure. Ah, oh, the physics. I like the physics. The thing about the assets is that there's a permanency about them. Take, for instance, the housing market. You hear that the market is uh, in meltdown, it's collapsed, it's crashed. Uh, have all the houses crashed as well? No, the houses are actually still there, though the people inside are rather unhappy about it. So this gives us the first piece of the jigsaw. This is starting from the assets. Taking the main parts of the economy, three sectors, that's manufacturing, the construction industry, and the service sector. This is a model. Each of these is quantified. The first one within the model has X amount of factories, Y of construction assets, and Z of service buildings. The next piece is to look at what they do within the economy. And the width of these lines is the amount of value they have, the production, gross domestic production, as it says on the tin. Travelling, as it were, from left to right. Think of these as conveyor belts. The conveyor belt for the top is straightforward. You can picture the goods on there. The conveyor belt for the bottom, a bit trickier. The bottom one for services consists of distribution and transport services, it consists of hotel and communication services. It consists of finance and banking services, public administration, defence, education services, health and social work. All those have been lumped together. One thing that's not in here is change of ownership. That's not part of production. Let's suppose I speculate, I buy some sort of property and I'm lucky enough that it increases in value. When I come to sell, I've got more money, and somebody else has got less, but nothing's really changed. That's the point I want to make to do with this view of looking at production. I mentioned housing, that's an important asset. That's down at the bottom, but there's no economic output that actually follows from the housing. These assets need inputs to metamorphose into the outputs. What I'm showing here now is uh, electricity, natural gas, and jobs. And here the lines represent different units. The width of the lines are the electricity, or the natural gas, or the number of jobs. And by the way, this data is for the UK, but I think it's fairly typical of developed economies. You need some more inputs. These are imports of goods and services and energy. And in fact, we can see that the lines have become a bit wider on the right. There's another way to look at GDP. My next piece. And this is looking at the end. End consumption. Purchasing of goods and services by plane, you and me. We also benefit from government services, which are paid for indirectly. There's also demand from exports. And you can see a line going up the top. That's for investment, but I'll get on to that in a moment. I want to link the, the end production to the end expenditure, sorry, to the production. We've got a piece missing. It doesn't look as if they're going to join together. It's called intermediate demand, and it connects them together. So there's equality to these two perspectives of how we look at GDP. And what we see there is that the service sector needs stuff. So the goods are coming from the top down. And equally, goods need the benefit of services. So actually, the goods leaving the factory need to go through 
transportation and distribution, so they're retail that where we can actually purchase them. I'll come back now to those important assets. This is what the investment is for. Okay, this time it's travelling from right to left. Now think of this conveyor belt of goods, construction services and other services which end up metamorphosing into the assets. One important point about this is that it pulls away the veil of subsidies. The thing is, if something's expensive, it is expensive. It is actually using these resources. And then within national accounts, it shows what's actually going on, how the economy is working. Now I can bring all the pieces together. When my graphic designer and I got to this point, we were pretty chuffed that we got this picture. And what we have here is data joining the dots. This is a window onto the model that is not, has not got an agenda, it, it's agnostic. Okay, the textbooks tell us that growth is that yearning for more, more, more. Hmm. If we look across this picture here, what are the main things that are going on? These are the thick lines I've now reduced it down to. The service section is producing the most output, it has the most number of jobs, and it's needing the thickest line for investment. When purchasers make the decisions, these ripple back to the supply chain, and that ripples further back upstream. But I'm going to now look a bit more closely at the time variation, because these pictures here are just a snapshot. The service sector output since 1990 has been rising. Also, too, the number of jobs in the sector have been increasing. Now, let me ask a question. Have the number of jobs per unit output changed or increased? Just imagine you've got a small organization that's been producing the same volume of output of services. Have they managed to keep the same number of people employed? Well, the answer is no. When you relate those two curves, you find that the number of jobs you need per unit output has been steadily decreasing. When we look at all those services that are listed all put together. So, what it means is that we need the service sector to grow to make up for the jobs that are displaced, the jobs that result from productivity, or the, the loss of jobs that are because the organizations are evolving, remaining viable in the market. So, essentially, growth of the economy is about growth of the service sector. That's an important point. That's the conclusion I come to by taking this perspective. What does all this say about banking? Let me go back to that investment. This flow of resource is when society is deciding how to increase on assets, and banking has a strong influence on that investment path. Now, in the short term, the, the market, the free market, is uh, very good at optimization. But in the long term, the free market does not design the best strategy. And I now want to apply four tests to this investment route that gives a better strategy and is to do with information sharing. The first test is to do with maintaining the growth of the service sector. Because the scourge is unemployment. The way that we keep the jobs is by growing the sector, and therefore we mustn't divert that investment, a huge amount of investment that goes to that sector. The second test is that we actually need a bit more investment. We need to divert from that end consumption 
to some more investment. We need to show the benefits that this investment would bring, make it exciting. The third test is to do with building the assets. Speculation is not part of this vision. Building a wind turbine is. The last test, the fourth test, is to do with testing the effectiveness of these investments. If the investment is needed a subsidy, it's using more resources, so you need to check that has a wider benefit than merely the commercial here. If the investment is reducing the cost of running the building, that means that the borrowers are in a better position to pay back. So these four tests encapsulate my vision to improve society and to make a difference for good. Thank you.